The scripture reading for this morning, we are going through John's gospel, but we're going to go to Luke's gospel. And the reason we're going to Luke's gospel is to get kind of another view on a couple of personalities, some very interesting personalities, uh, two sisters by the name, names of Martha and Mary. So, Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. A uh, challenging passage. Some people who are more practically minded uh, sympathize with Martha, even after reading that, even after reading uh, Jesus' you know, gentle rebuke. It's kind of like, well, these things need to be taken care of, and Mary's not helping, and how do you... So you see the difference in personality, and we, you, know, you see it in, you're, among yourselves. I see it among my own kids. It's kind of funny how everything plays out. But anyway, I wanted to draw this, it, it, you, uh, your attention to the story because it will show up again as we deal with the story involving Martha and Mary in John's Gospel this morning. Let's, let's take some time and pray. Father in heaven, thank you that we are still here, that we can come here in person, that people can join us online. Lord, we're thankful in this time of a, a pandemic that we can be together in person as your body. It's a blessing, Lord, and maybe something we've taken for granted throughout the years, but Lord, we've come to appreciate it more now. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will be with us. Open our ears and our hearts to what is being said through your word, and I pray that it will go down and change us and make a difference. And Lord, as we worship you, help us to put aside all the distractions, all the things that would get in the way, well, as much as we can, and to focus on worshiping you. Thank you for who you are and for the good things you've done in our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, I forgot to make a, another very important announcement. Lisa Proudfoot is here, and uh, well, you know her much better than I do, actually. And she has decided that she's going to help us out with the music this morning. And I'm looking forward to it.
may be seated. Have you been to a, a few funerals? I bet some of you have. I think, in fact, in my life now, that uh, the number of funerals I've attended may have surpassed the number of weddings that I've been to. And one thing that always strikes me when I come out of a funeral is thinking, wow, that, is that really it? You know, this, this life, this, this human being who's, who lived for, well, whatever it was, whether it was just a child or someone who lived until their 80s or their 90s, and it's just, uh, we meet together, we say a few things, um, a little brief summary of the, the high points of the person's life, and a few silly anecdotes, and then it's all said and done, and they're buried, and it, it feels like there should be more. It feels like this is, this is not enough, that it just, is this how it ends? Is this all that there is? And you know what? And when you read the Bible, it, it kind of, it confirms this if you're reading in certain places. And David writes in Psalm 103, verse 15, the life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. And if you're a gardener, you know this is the case, right? As the seasons roll on, you know, there was that one plant maybe that did well, another plant that didn't, but it all end at the end of the year when the harvest comes in and then the snow falls, well, it's, it dies and it goes on the, the pile and it's forgotten about and it's, it's gone and nobody remembers. And just in case... Uh, and, and actually, my personal readings, I've been going through the book of Ecclesiastes. And if you ever want to pick me up, you, you read through the book of Ecclesiastes. And I jest, of course. But Ecclesiastes also has some interesting things to say about death. And here's what uh, the author says about yeah, death, starting in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 11. No one remembers the former generations. And even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. And from chapter 9, verse 5, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even their name is forgotten. Their love, their hate, and their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. And if this is all that there is, if it's just, you know, you live, you're born, you live, and then you die, and that's it, well, as, as the author of Ecclesiastes says, it's pretty depressing. And he goes on and says, well, it just, what's, what's a good, what's the point of being good or, or, or all that if, if you're bad and you, you end up going in the same place, whether you work really hard to, to make the world a better place or if you just live for yourself, you, you end up six feet below and that's it and that's all. It just, it seems unjust to him and it can seem unjust to us. So that's, that's the injustice that death ha has. You know, it just, it evens things out in life when it shouldn't be even out, when life isn't fair, when, when someone who does her terrible things, they end up in the same place as someone who works really hard to do good things. It just, it doesn't make sense. It's not just. And death also hurts those who are left behind. And if you want to read something about that, um, C.S. Lewis wrote a very poignant group book called a grief observed when his wife passed away. And in it, he, he talks well, just like the Psalms do. He's, he's upset at God. He's, up, he's feeling like he's been ripped in half and he's trying to mull it all over and his, his thoughts are very dark and, it, and you have to go with him on this, this journey to like pretty much through the valley of the shadow of death to come out on the other side. And that's, that's how it is. That's how we experience things. That's how it, it can be. And I know and I have known many widows and widowers in my life who still really miss their spouses. You know, years and decades later, they, they look back and you know what, that, that wound is, you know, it's, maybe it's kind of healed over a bit, but the scar is still there and they still really miss the person that they've lost. Okay, Pastor Brad, that's got to be the most depressing opening you've ever come up with. So why are, we, why, are we, why are we doing this? Why are we going through all these, these thoughts about, about death and its finality and how it's, it's wrong and how it hurts? It's because sometimes in Scripture, when, when, we, when we look at Scripture, you know, I read you know, little Bible stories with my, my son at bedtime sometimes, and it's just like, 
well, there's a, a little bit of a problem, but then Jesus fixes it. And it's kind of like, we get to the, we go to the highlights, we go to the good parts, and all the characters are smiling, everybody's happy, every, everything is okay, and that's kind of how we can look at the Bible itself. But that's not what the Bible is like. Sometimes we need to slow down and remember that death is something that really hurts. Death is something that sometimes doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And it's something that we all, in some ways, have to look forward to. And it's something that we're all reminded of, even though our society tends to brush it under the rug. So with that in mind, and it won't stay there, it will get better, I promise. Uh, If you have your Bibles, please turn with them to John's Gospel, chapter 11. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha, which is why we read that passage this morning. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. And you'll notice that this, John doesn't actually recount this until later. But in John's time, all the, you know, the, the traditions and the stories about Jesus would have already circulated. And so the, his first audience would have been thinking, oh, this is the Mary who did this even before John actually tells the story. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that, the, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days, and then he says to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After After he had said this to them, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking about his, of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. So just in case you didn't follow my instruction and uh, read the last part of John 10 from the last Sunday, I'll I'll get you up to speed. So Jesus, in the last last part of John 10, is identifying himself with the Father. When he talks about that close relationship, the Jews there understand that he's making a claim to divinity and they want to stone him. And then Jesus makes an argument from the Psalms and then they just want to arrest him. And then Jesus escapes to where John the Baptist was, had been baptizing before, and he kind of has a period of rest. So in other words, he's a wanted man as, as far as Judea goes. If he steps foot in there, then he's endangering himself, and he's potentially endangering the life of his disciples as well. So why does Jesus do this? Why does he return to Judea if it puts his own life in danger and the life of his disciples in danger? And if he was going to return in any case, why does he delay after he hears that Lazarus is sick? Well, these are questions that we have. The text doesn't necessarily answer them directly. But after reading through uh, some various viewpoints, um, one thing I found compelling was the idea of God's timing. Do you remember when um, Jesus, earlier on in John, when uh, Jesus is up to, about to go, Jesus' brothers want him to go up to the festival? because they want him to make a big splash. He says, well, you know, you don't make a name for yourself if you stick around in a backwater like Galilee. You have to go to Jerusalem to make it big, right? Just like you'd have to go to New York to make it big if you're from Oyen. But, um, but Jesus said, you know, any time is good for you, but I'm on God's timetable, not on your timetable. And, and earlier on, his first sign, remember at the wedding in Cana, 
when his mother comes to him, he says, you know what, mother, it has to be on God's time. And then she has to, Mary submits to Jesus' will, and then that's when he does the miracle. So part of it is Jesus operates on his own timetable. And that's how God works in our lives too. Sometimes we want God, you know, we say, we want you to do this. We want you to do this now. We, we, we have all these concerns and we have these worries. And, and this is, you need, really need to do this right now. And God sometimes says, well, maybe yes, sometimes in some cases, but sometimes he says you have to wait or this is going to happen or it's going to be on God's timing. So why does Jesus respond to his disciples like he does, right? Because they're concerned for his welfare and maybe their own welfare and his, his own well-being. And he's, they're asking him, okay, well, you were just about to die. You were just about to be stone, stoned. And are you really going to go back to Judea at this time? And Jesus answers with this parable about daylight. And of course, um, you know, we think about if we're walking around in the dark, it's, it's not so bad if you're an oyen because we have lights out and we... And, you know, there's street lights and there's lights from this and that. And you can get away around in the dark if you have to. But again, in the ancient world, and if you go to a farm in the middle of nowhere with the lights turned out, it's, when it's dark, it's dark. And you're going to run into things and you're going to be in trouble. And um, what I think is going on here is that Jesus is talking about 12 hours you know, of daylight as a window of opportunity to do God's work. Jesus has a certain amount of time on earth to accomplish his objective. And in that certain amount of time, he's also doing God's work. He's following God's will, and that's, because that's what God has given him to do. And if he doesn't, if he turns aside from that into the darkness, then things are going to stumble, then things are going to go wrong. But now he's acting within this window of time to do God's work. And his disciples need to do the same. Just like each of us, have, we each have a window of time to do God's work. We have every, each of us has the same number of hours in a day to do the things that we need to do and to serve God. And we need to take advantage of that. Now, why does Jesus delay? Well, when we, when we look later on in the story and we do the math, we realize that Jesus' delay does not actually prolong Lazarus' suffering. It's not like Lazarus is on his deathbed and Jesus is just kind of chilling and just waiting for him to expire. No, if we look at the timeline, Lazarus would have been dead actually before the messengers arrived to tell Jesus about it. So Jesus works on God's timetable, not everyone else's. And the end result of this is that it actually intensifies the effect of his, of his sign. And that's why Jesus says later on, and for, and for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. Okay, so, and the other interesting thing is that uh, Thomas acts as the spokesperson instead of Peter. Now, I don't know what keeps you up at night, but I, I'm a kind of a meticulous person, and I like to investigate things. And, um, you know, when you're reading the Gospels, you wonder, okay, there's this amazing sign here. This is a, an amazing story about Martha and Mary and Lazarus, but it doesn't show up in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, why is this? Why would this spectacular sign only be recorded in John and not in the so-called synoptic Gospels? And um, I can't, I'm not going to offer a full reason here because that would be just way too long and distract us too much. But just so you know that there are answers to some of these sorts of things. There, we, we have a, something, well, it's more than a, a church tradition that Peter was the one who, that Mark was referring to when he wrote the, when he wrote his gospel, in fact, you know, people just say talk about church tradition, and then I kind of, in my mind, I think, well, what is it? A tradition that someone made up two hundred years later? I want to know who said it, when, and why, and 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 how, and all these questions. That you know, these are things that I have. This is what keeps me up at night. I don't know if you care, but I'm just gonna go with you for this one, just because I I've been reading the the church fathers, and I actually managed to dig this up. So I'm I'm gonna tell you because it's I like it and it's fun. Okay, so according to a bishop of the early church named Papias, who is recorded by Eusebius, oh yes, we have it right here, uh, an early church historian, John the Elder said that, and here's the quote, Mark, having become Peter's interpreter, wrote down accurately everything he remembered, though not in order of the things either said or done by Christ. 
Okay, so I've been beating around the bush on this. How is this relevant to the question of why this sign is left out of Matthew, Mark, and Luke? And the answer is that Thomas is a spokesman because maybe Peter is not there. And if, if Mark depended on Peter's account when he wrote his gospel, and Peter wasn't there to witness it, it makes sense that Thomas is speaking up and John records it and that Mark does not. And according to scholars, a lot of scholars think this, not all, but most, um, Matthew and Luke's account depend on Mark's account to some degree when they're putting it together. And you can read about Luke and how he tries to put it in an orderly event in, in the first chapter of his gospel. So there's just uh, one example of sometimes these, these questions, these niggling things, and then you get skeptical scholars coming in. They, they do have answers, and we can find them, and it is credible. The other thing I want to draw you to, your attention to is that uh, Thomas is often known as Doubting Thomas. But here, he displays some courage. He realizes that by going with Jesus into Judea, where you know Ju- Jesus is a wanted man, that this could be the end of the road, not only for Jesus, but for them as well. And so he goes and he puts a brave face on it and he gets ready to follow Jesus to the end. Maybe it's not demonstrating a lot of faith in Jesus, but it does demonstrate some loyalty. Though we have to balance that with the fact that when it came down to it, Thomas, along with all the disciples, abandoned Jesus in the garden. Okay, after that interesting historical tidbit, let's move on to verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days, and that's how we get the math on that. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. So when we think of the phrase, mourn with those who mourn, That's a phrase that we associate with the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans, uh, chapter 12, verse 15. But it actually pops up in Jewish writing prior to Paul's time. And grieving with the bereaved was taken very seriously by the Jews in Jesus' time. And this is what the historian Josephus tells us. It's in old language because I didn't have a contemporary translation. Our Allah hath also taken care of the decent burial of the dead, but without any extravagant expenses for their funerals, and without the erection of any illustrious monuments for them, but hath ordered that their nearest relations should perform their obsequies, and hath hath shown it to be regular that all who pass by when anyone is buried should accompany the funeral and join in the lamentation. So if you missed it because of the language, the basic idea is that in Jewish culture, if you see someone go by and there's a, there's a funeral procession, you actually join in on that and you, and you mourn with them. You show solidarity with the, 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 with the family. So mourning with those who mourn was something that was taken very seriously by God's people and something that we should still do today. And so um, mourners, the other thing about uh, Jewish culture at the time was that mourners were expected to welcome people who were, comforted them, who were comforting them in their own homes. So when Martha actually gets up to go see Jesus, she's showing him a great deal of, of, uh, of respect. And also, you know, we know that she is a practical, hands-on kind of person from Luke's account. So it's, it's not really surprising that she's the one who's barreling out of there and going to meet Jesus. And their conversation is an interesting one. Verse 21. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come, who is to come into the world. An interesting conversation. Let's break it down. So when Martha says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, is she accusing Jesus of neglect? Or is she demonstrating her faith? In terms of how, the way this conversation goes, when she says, I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask, and she's talking about the resurrection, 
I think that she is expressing her faith here. I don't think that it's like accusation, you know, Lord, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. But, you know, Lord, I know that if you were here, my brother would not have died. In other words, she knows that Jesus has, would have had the power to make her brother well. And when she says, I know even now that God will give you whatever you ask, I don't think she had the resurrection of mind, uh, the resurrection of her brother in mind, because as we'll, we'll see later on in the text, she, it's, she doesn't act like it and she doesn't talk like it. But she does affirm that Jesus is empowered by God and that Jesus is doing his will. So she has faith in who Jesus is. But Jesus is trying to get Martha to go deeper. So he challenges her. I am the resurrection and the life. And he goes on, and then do you believe this? And this leads to Martha's confession of faith. Now, often when we talk about uh, confession of who Jesus is, everybody goes to Peter's confession of faith. And this is what we get back in uh, chapter 6, verse 68, where, where Peter says, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And now more, Martha says, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. So her declaration of faith is, no, is not any less substantial than Peter's. Like the woman at the well, and like everyone who sticks by Jesus, Martha belongs to Jesus' flock, and he knows her, and he loves her. Let's get back to what Jesus says, though, that I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Now, of course, millions of followers of Jesus have, have died. So what Jesus is, you know, over the past two millennia. So what Jesus is talking about here doesn't mean that if you accept him as your Lord and Savior, you're going to live forever and you're never going to die physically. No, he's talking about living spiritually. And at the, at the end day, like Martha says, we will be resurrected and we will have bodies like the body that Jesus has now. A body not like ours that's going to age and get wrinkles. My kids love pointing out the wrinkles on my head. And, you know, that degrades and, you know, you get hunched over and all, well, you know about it. And all the rest of it, it's, that's not that kind of body that we're going to have. We're going to have one that is specifically designed to live forever with God, with the Lord. And this is the hope that we have. So remember all the depressing stuff I read from Ecclesiastes and Psalms at the beginning of the sermon? All that is erased. All this idea that, well, it doesn't matter because everything, everybody dies anyway. And it doesn't matter if you live for yourself or you live for God or if you try to help other people or you are mean and nasty to other people, everybody dies. No, that's, life doesn't stop there. Life, things will be evened out. There will be justice in this life. God will judge the righteous and the wicked. And he will set everything to rights. This is the hope that Jesus gives. By being the resurrection in the life, we, can't, we can no longer say, well, it doesn't matter how you live. Or life, life is just unfair, life is rotten, brutish, nasty, and short, and then you die. That's not the end of the story any longer because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. That is the hope that we have as followers of Jesus. Verse 28. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind, the blind man, have kept this man from dying? So there's a lot to unpack here. But first I want to uh, draw your attention to how some people are 
intrinsically more emotional than others. Now, this is a, a dynamic that plays out in my family in multiple ways. When I, when I see how my, my two eldest daughters uh, interact and how they deal with life, I don't even think, no, they think I'm talking. I don't think they realize I'm talking about them. <laughs> Just checking. One of them has a very emotional, outgoing response. And it's fun. It's, and the highs are high and the lows are low. It's just that kind of a dynamic, right? And one of them is a little bit more even keeled. And even in my relationship with Liella, right? So I, I tend to be the one who's kind of like, okay, well, we're just going to deal with it and we're going to be this way. And then, but Liella, if someone else is crying, she will inevitably cry as well. That just, that's how God made us. It's not that one way is superior to the other. It's just that there's that, that kind of variation with people. So how does, we, we have already seen how Jesus responds to Martha, how, she, how he talks things through with her, how he reasons with her, and how he brings her to a confession of faith. How does he respond to Mary? Well, he doesn't rebuke her for her lack of faith or, or, or criticize her or say, or offer a platitude, you know, it's, it's, it's all going to be okay, You're, they're there, you know, at the resurrection everything's going to be fine. He doesn't try to offer her any words of, of solace or comfort. What he does is he weeps with her. And for Mary, that's exactly what was needed. It wasn't, she didn't need Jesus to come along and, and say, I am the resurrection and the life, this is who I am, and, and this is all that's going on. No, what, what Mary needed right at that moment was someone who would sympathize with her grief and would enter into it with her. And Jesus cares about Mary. And she see, he sees that she's suffering. And so he's moved by her suffering and he weeps as well. Because that's the kind of man Jesus is. As the author of Hebrews writes, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have, one who is, we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Remember, Jesus is not only fully God, he's fully human as well. Jesus understands suffering and loss. He understands the pang of death. He understands what it's like to feel moved by the suffering of other people. So even, the, and then we, so we, we've talked about Martha and how Jesus responds to her. We've talked about Mary and how she responds to her. And then there's also the Jews who are there to comfort Mary and Martha. And they're doing exactly what they should do. They're there to mourn with those who mourn. They're there to comfort her. But yet they, they still miss the boat. Jesus is, is sympathizing with Mary. She, he is entering into her grief. He's not sad because Lazarus is dead and gone and he won't see his friend again because he, he knows what he's about to do. But he sees Mary suffering and he enters into it with her, right? He's, 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 he weeps because he's weeping with Mary. And so, but the Jews think because, you know, in this life, usually when someone dies, that, that's it until the resurrection. They're, they're gone anymore. They say, okay, well, Jesus is He's weeping for Lazarus. So they're, they're kind of missing the boat there. And then the other people are saying, well, why didn't, why didn't he get there on time? Because, you know, just a, a while ago, he was healing this man who was born blind. Well, couldn't he have stopped Lazarus from dying if he cared for them enough? And so they're, they're kind of missing the boat. But their misunderstanding, of course, given the circumstances, is understandable. Let's go on and see what Jesus does. Verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Now, why is Jesus deeply moved here? Um, scholars have been debating about this literally from ancient times. Some uh, will tell you, based on the, the Greek vocabulary, that Jesus is actually angry about something. And then the question is, well, what is he angry about? Is he angry with the Jews? Is he angry with Mary and Martha for their alleged lack of faith? Where, where does it, you know, they, so they look, they're looking for a target. Okay, Jesus is mad. He must be mad at someone. What's the reason for that? But other people say, well, this vocabulary is used in other ways, and it doesn't necessarily mean anger, and they go back and forth. But the, 
The truth of the matter is that the text just doesn't tell us why Jesus is deeply moved. So here is my two cents for what it's worth, and realize that it's only my two cents. I don't think that Mary and Martha are being rebuked here for their lack of faith. When they say, Lord, if you, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died, they're saying something about Jesus. They, they're acknowledging that he has the power to heal, and they're, sta- they're stating a fact. And I don't think, and if we look at the rest of the Bible, when, I mean, in the Psalms, when, when the psalmist is wrestling with, with God and stuff like that, and he expresses concern and sometimes even doubt, I don't think Jesus is, is mad at them for their lack of unbelief. I think Jesus is moved here, deeply moved, again, because he cares, because he loves, because when he sees the people that he cares about so deeply suffering, it moves him too. Just like Liella, when she sees people crying, is moved to tears. That's how Jesus was. Jesus is moved because he cares. Verse 39, take away the stone, he said. The Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad order, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. That must have been quite something to witness. Maybe a little spooky, a little eerie. But let's break it down. Let's start at the beginning. The almost entertaining part at the beginning of this this section is Martha's protests. So you can see from this line that that she doesn't fully understand what Jesus is about to do because she's thinking, oh, well, Jesus, whoa, 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 what are you doing here? This this is crazy. If you take away that stone, it's going to reek. It's going to be nasty. I mean, my brother is decaying in here. It's, It's kind of like I'm, I'm reading into it, you know, it's a violation of, of what are you doing, Jesus? And so she's still practically minded. She's still concerned. She's, you know, very much rooted in reality, but she doesn't get what Jesus is about to do. And here Jesus makes a choice when he raises Lazarus from the dead. Now in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have two examples of Jesus raising people from the dead. There's, um, Remember Jairus, uh, the man with the daughter who's, who Jesus raises from the dead? But the thing is that that's a private display of his power. Jesus warns them. He just takes, remember, Peter, James, and John, and he tells his parents not to tell anybody. So that's a private thing that's kept private until he, he rises from the dead. And then he, when he raises the, the widow's son in Nain, right? That's something that's kind of tucked away in Luke's gospel and not much more is said about this. But here... It's public. Everybody is around. Everybody's here to witness it. And in front of them all, Jesus prays to the Father so that they know this isn't Jesus, you know, taking the glory for himself. He's giving the glory to God. And he's making the connection clear between God as his Father and who he is. I'm doing this on God's authority, not my own. And that's when he raises Lazarus from the dead. So this is a display of power. This is something that if you're confronted with it, you've got to make a choice about. Now, interesting, because I just can't help myself, and I've been going through the Church Fathers, and I found a little fragment from the works of a certain quadratus that preserved, again, by Eusebius, that tells us something about the people that Jesus raised from the dead. And this is how it runs. But the works of our Savior were always present, for they were true. Those who were healed... And those who rose from the dead were seen not only when they were healed and when they were raised, but were constantly present. And not only while the Savior was living, but even after he had gone, they were alive for a long time, so that some of them survived to our own time. So back in the day, people were walking around 
who have been raised by Jesus from the dead. Living, breathing testimonies to Jesus' power and might. And we have, outside of Scripture even, a reference to this happening. But back to the point of people making a choice. Verse 45. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. What on earth is going on here? I mean, we would like to think, of course, that if we ever saw something like that, that we'd be the ones who believed. And I mean, that's just the, kind of the natural thing to do. When you, when you see someone who's been in, lying in a grave for four days and should be well on his way to decomposition, you know, you see him get up and walk out, well, you would think, well, that person and the person who raised him is, saying, is obviously in commune with God the Father. It's like, wow, that person is, is the real deal. This is, this is something serious. This is something undeniable. I mean, we got we to gotta believe in Jesus. But even this does not convince a certain type of people who instead of, of becoming believers right there on the spot, go and inform on Jesus. So sometimes, no matter what kind of evidence you present for your faith, what kind of arguments, no matter if they're airtight, no matter if you, you have everything perfectly aligned and the, the evidence is just right, some people do not want to be convinced. Some people just say, no, I can't deal with that. It doesn't fit my system. I don't want to believe it, and I'm not going to, and you can't make me. This happens in life, and, and we know it happens, because sometimes, well, in more minor cases than this, some people live in denial of, of basic facts. I mean, you can present with them all the evidence, but they have the way, the way they were raised or the way they think, they just say, nope, 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 can't be it. It's not it. You can't make me believe it. I won't. And those, sometimes those sort of people, we just have to leave them to God and to his mercy. Okay, so what's the takeaway from all of this? Well, there are three things that I want you to remember. First of all, and this is the important thing, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. So when, as Christians, when we're confronted with death, like Paul says, we don't have to grieve like those who have no hope. Now, we should grieve with those who experience loss. We should mourn with those who mourn. We should follow the example of the Jews who came out from Jerusalem to mourn with uh, Martha and Mary. We, don't, we should do those things. But we should comfort one another by reminding one another that death does not have the final say. Death has been conquered. And without Jesus, without the resurrection, you might as well eat, drink, and be merry, for you don't know when you're going to die. That's just the way it is. You can read through Ecclesiastes, and it will give you a blow, you know, it's great stuff of kind of a blow-by-blow. Blow. This is how pointless and meaningless life is out, without Jesus, without the resurrection. This is what life is like. And there's a reason Ecclesiastes is, is popular not only in the church today, but even in secular circles. And I think you can get a translation of it from Penguin because people realize the truth of what it says. But again, Jesus changes everything. Now, more practically, remember how Jesus comforts Mary and Martha. When you're comforting other people you got some, and you know them, there are different ways to, to comfort different people. If you're dealing with someone who is more emotional, sometimes what someone needs is not like, a, you know, well, Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. And, and you know, we, we're, the Apostle Paul tells us that we should not mourn with those who mourn and something like that. Sometimes what a person needs is not someone to give them words, but just to come alongside of them and weep with them, to share in their mourning, to be there for them. Because sometimes words don't suffice. Some, we, can, we can't always just get right to the point where, you know, everything is better and everything is okay. We, sometimes we have to go through that journey, through, through the dark valleys. And God leads us there. And God knows that there's, this is part of the process, that the, the part of the pain, part of the anguish, part of the, the doubt. I mean, Jesus himself 
on the cross says, quoting the Psalms, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if Jesus could do that, and we're followers of him, then we can express our frustration and our, our anger to God because he can take it. And he understands that we are more, we're just human beings, we're mortal, and he'll take us and guide us through that journey in, in our anger, in our grief, and our frustration. And if we want to help people, sometimes we need to be like Job's friends at the beginning when they just sat there and said nothing. When they opened their mouths, they messed up. But when they sat in the beginning, you know, that's, that's how we need to be. Other people are, might be different. Other people are searching. They're trying to, to pull it together. They want someone to talk with them, to, to work through it because they're trying to make sense out of it. And so that, that's a point where we can, with gentleness and humility, tr- engage with them a little bit, to hear what they have to say, to, to read through Scripture together, to, to sort things out. So when you're comforting someone, keep in mind who you're comforting because that's what Jesus did. And the third thing is how people act react to evidence. When you're sharing the gospel with some people, not everyone is going to accept it with open arms. And it doesn't matter how airtight your argument is. It doesn't matter how persuasive you are. It doesn't how many times you try to hammer it home. They're not at the place where they can take it. And at that point, all you can do is pray and pray that God will work in their lives, that he'll open up doors and opportunities, that he'll do something to, to turn these people to him. And ultimately, you have to leave them in God's hands. So again, those are the three things to take away. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Think about the people that you comfort and be prepared when you present evidence for the gospel that some people will accept it and some people will reject it. Next week, we will see how Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead sets a chain of events into motion that will eventually result in in the passion. Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth that it conveys. Lord, thank you for the records even outside of your word that point to its truth and veracity. Lord, what a, what a treasure. And we're thankful for that, the hope that we have. Help us to remember that you are the resurrection and the life and that following you in this life, even if it involves suffering, even if it involves giving up things that we really want, it's not futile and it just doesn't end in meaninglessness or in death. Lord, but whatever we suffer for your sake will turn into a reward and that in the end, we will be with you. And we're so thankful for that. Lord, give us courage to share your truth with your world and to live it out in our daily lives. Help us to be people who love and comfort others in their distress. And Lord, we pray for the wisdom in terms of how to, how to comfort them and be with them. Thank you for our time together and for all the good things you give. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, my Savior.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace, courage, this week to serve the Lord. Amen.